I want to talk to you now, <clears throat> briefly, about Karima Banun. She grew up in Algeria and the United States and is the winner of the 2014 Dayton Literary Peace Prize Award in nonfiction for her book, one of my favorite titles of all time, Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here. Love that. She is a professor of international law at the University of California, Davis School of Law. Tonight we are all celebrating with her. You didn't know this, but you are. We are all celebrating with her as she was recently appointed by the United Nations as the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. How about that? She also sits on the uh, board of the Network of Women Living Under Muslim Laws. Her publications have been featured in the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Reuters, as well as the Guardian's site, Comment is Free, and aljazeera.com, and Open Democracy. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Karima Benoun. Thank you so much. Dayton, I love you. <laughs> Absolutely. It is so wonderful to be here. And I have to say I now think of Dayton, Ohio as the literary capital of the United States of America. It is, as Nick Clooney so kindly mentioned, a very special day for me because it's actually today that I became the United Nations Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, and I am truly delighted that my first official act as Special Rapporteur is to congratulate the organizers of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize on its 10th anniversary. It has been a glorious decade of promoting literary excellence in the pursuit of peace, and I am so honored uh, to have been a small part of that decade. So in this new UN post, I have a huge mandate, virtually no budget, and absolutely no salary. <laughs> and this is something which I know our next awardee understands very well. <laughs> Among my tasks will be defending artistic, educational, and scientific freedom in the world and contributing to the protection of cultural heritage. And I hope that I can count on all of you to join me in this work as we live in times when a 20-year-old can destroy a 2,000-year-old temple in the blink of an eye. And we have to work together to change that. As the director of the Afghan National Museum, Omara Khan Masoudi said to me when I interviewed him for your fatwa does not apply here, he said, a nation stays alive when its culture stays alive. That, of course, as Mr. Masoudi knew all too well, often requires individuals to take huge risks. For those of you who did me the great honor of reading your fatwa does not apply here after my visit last year, I have to share some very sad news about one of those in the book who did just that. The amazing woman whose life's work gave its name to chapter two of my book, which is called Karachi Open Mic Night, Ms. Sabine Mahmoud was assassinated on April 24th, 2015 by jihadist terrorists, becoming the second woman in my book to die since I interviewed her. I hope that you will always remember her story, because I know that I will. Sabine Mahmoud was the founder of an organization called Peace Niche, and she ran the cultural arts cafe called T2F, which hosts diverse literary, artistic, and political programming in the festive war zone that is the amazing city of Karachi. She brought Indian and Pakistani musicians together to play via Skype. She openly challenged Pakistan's murderous blasphemy laws. At the inimitable T2F, I heard young people sing the words of Faiz Ahmed Faiz, the national poet of Pakistan, followed by Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah. And you have never heard Leonard, Co Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah till you've heard it at Karachi Open Mic Night. 
Sabine Mahmoud defied terror in multiple forms to champion the right to culture, and so I wanted to remember her with you this evening. She embodied the spirit of the line from Faiz Ahmed Faiz, which insists that tyrants cannot snuff out the moon, so today nor tomorrow, no tyranny will succeed. Though she is gone now, Sabine's light, which she bequeaths us all, cannot be snuffed out either. And we must honor that light by continuing her work to promote culture as both a celebration of our shared humanity, but also as a peacemaking tool, the very thing that the Dayton Literary Peace Prize recognizes. The line from Faiz Ahmed Faiz is also a perfect Pakistani description of the exuberant and indefatigable determination of Mr. Brian Stevenson to prevent the snuffing out of the moon for so many imprisoned people in this country. A commitment that fills every single page of his heartbreakingly beautiful book, which you all must read and give to everyone that you know. I am deeply honored that my second act as UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights is to present the 2015 Dayton Literary Peace Prize for nonfiction to Brian Stevenson for this amazing work. There is so much that I want to say about him that I don't know where to begin or when I might stop, which could be much longer than my allotted time. So please bear with me or pull me off the stage if you are so inclined. Uh, but the jacket of his book says that he may be America's Mandela. And when you first pick up the book, you think this is another one of those literary blurbs based on hyperbola. And you're about 50 pages in and you realize, no, that is simply the truth. Brian Stevenson is a heroic human rights lawyer. We don't often use that term inside the United States because we don't often conceptualize what happens here as amounting to human rights violations. But after you read Brian's book, you know that we should, and all too often. The pattern of mass incarceration he has been fighting for years and that he describes in Just Mercy through the masterful interweaving of wrenching personal stories often results, as he depicts it, in cruel punishment, arbitrary detention, unfair trials, racial and social discrimination, and in some cases, outright torture in violation of the international legal obligations of the United States. This is a widespread pattern, not in any way incidental. And one of Brian's great contributions is to use individual narratives to portray in devastating detail a system of abuse based on racism and economic injustice, and rooted in the histories of slavery, of segregation, and of normalized inequality. We are forced to see the real human faces that inhabit that stark landscape, not merely to face the disturbing statistics that he also quotes, such as the fact that we have sent a quarter million children to adult prisons and jails to serve long terms. Rather than running from this horrifying reality and having the comfortable life he could have had as a lawyer with an elite education and as an official certified MacArthur genius, Brian Stevenson has instead run toward those most in need. And he has embraced their humanity and their human rights and has challenged us as a society and as individuals to do the same thing. Why do we want to kill all the broken people, he asked after saying goodbye to his client, Jimmy Dill, who was about to be executed. What is wrong with us that we think a thing like that can be right? Brian has refused to accept the rendering invisible of such utterly unacceptable practices, and instead has spent his days on the road, traveling from court to cell to shack to expose them. Initially having to scrape together the financial and human resources to make the Equal Justice Initiative a reality, he and his colleagues have taken on as many cases as they could, and often many more than that, as they receive desperate plea for help after desperate plea for help. I don't know how he finds the hours in the day to run the EJI, to represent death row inmates and child detainees, and to do so with compassion and conviction, to speak widely to audiences, whether in church basements or at TED, and then on top of all of that, to write this beautiful book, to bear witness to the struggles of people we would never have known about but for his work. 
like Joe Sullivan, a 13-year-old disabled child who was sentenced to life in prison without parole for a sexual battery he did not commit after a trial that lasted for less than seven hours. When Brian first came to visit him in prison, while waiting in his wheelchair, Joe was placed in a cage so small that the guards were almost unable to extricate him. Or Marsha Colby, a poor white woman in, a r in rural Alabama and a mother of six, who was sentenced to life in prison without parole after being wrongfully convicted of murdering her newborn child, who was in actual fact stillborn. She served 10 years before Brian and EJI managed to win her release. And when she was released, she focused on the conditions of the women she left behind in prison. Or the main character in the central story which runs throughout this wonderful book, Walter McMillian, a black man who loved to work outdoors and ran his own pulpwood business and was sentenced to death for a murder he did not commit, serving six years on death row and actually being put on death row before he was convicted. I came to care so much about Walter that as I was reading, so I was desperately, frantically reading faster and faster to find out what might happen to him. And I will leave that to you to find out when you read Brian's book, which you absolutely must. I would say Brian's powerful stories told in clear, sincere, and lyrical prose made even this crusty human rights lawyer cry, although I did that again tonight. Uh, and I was about to say that's not an easy thing to do after all the stories I've heard, but I've just proven that false. But anyway, he did make me cry. And I know that as we honor Brian, we are also recognizing the courage of those on behalf of whom he has worked. And we are committing to caring about all of them. Because I don't feel the right to stand up here and praise Brian and his book and not do anything about the issues he teaches us about tomorrow. In fact, as both author and activist, Brian very helpfully at the end of his book says that if you are compelled by what you read, you can get involved, I can get involved, we can do something about it by visiting his organization's website at eji.org. What I find especially inspiring about Brian is that despite all that he has seen, he remains hopeful. He knows all too well what an Afghan woman once told me, which is that optimism is key to survival. He tells us just how badly wrong things have gone with our criminal justice system, but also how possible it is to fix it. In the last paragraph of his postscript, he notes, we can do better than we've done for the accused, convicted, and condemned among us, as well as for those who are victimized by crime and violence. And I was particularly struck by his commitment to go on with his work because the very last sentence on the very last page simply reads, the work continues. Some airlines have taken to giving a shout out to those on board who have served in the military, which is a nice thing to do. But I've been thinking that maybe we should also do the same thing with people in other professions who make huge sacrifices to protect others. So I too would like to take this moment to thank you sincerely, Brian, for your service to this country. And I'd like to imagine a world where we thanked human rights defenders over the intercom before takeoff. That is the world of the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. So please here this evening join me in saluting the inimitable, the undaunted, the inspiring, the supremely eloquent Brian Stevenson for the 316 pages of pure truth that he has given us and for the 20 plus years of hard work it took to distill that. We know from Dr. King that the moral arc of the universe is long, but that it bends toward justice. And we are forever indebted to Brian Stevenson for giving so much of himself, his heart, his soul, his words, to shortening that arc and bringing us closer to the beckoning light of that justice. Congratulations, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, what, a, what a special night. Uh, Karima, thank you for that incredibly uh, beautiful introduction. Uh, I'm really overwhelmed uh, to be here, to be in this space with so many extraordinary people, so many extraordinary writers. Um, my grandmother was the daughter of people who were enslaved. She was born in Bowling Green, Virginia in the 1880s. Her, her father was born in slavery in Virginia in the 1840s. And when I was a little boy, my grandmother was always in my ear about her experience of growing up enslaved. And my sister's here with me. And our grandmother had a profound impact on us. When I would see my grandmother as a little boy, uh, uh, I'd, she'd come up to me and she'd give me these hugs. And she would squeeze me so tightly I could barely breathe. And then if I saw her an hour later, she'd say to me, she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, she'd assault me again. <laughs> and I quickly learned to tell my grandmother, Mama, I feel you hugging me all the time. And it was just this way she had about her. And when we got older, my mother uh, would take uh, my sister and I to Philadelphia. She fled Virginia at the turn of the century because of the lynchings and the trauma and the terror uh, that was ravaging that part of the country. And she'd started a life in Philadelphia, raised my mom there. And when I would go and visit her, uh, when we would go and visit her as children, I would always be uh, kind of struck by the city because we grew up in the country. And I was, I, as I got older, I got more courageous and I would explore different parts of the city and I'd venture far and farther away from where she lived. And she would keep an eye on me and every now and then she would warn me about things. And uh, one day I'd been out with some boys I'd met on the street and we'd been kind of gone a long while and she was worried when I got back, uh, she uh, told me, she said, now you need to watch yourself because uh, uh, people will judge you by the company you keep. I trust you, but I don't know those other boys. So you just need to remember that people will judge you by the company that you keep. And my greatest regret tonight is that my uh, grandmother is not here. Uh, because if she was here, what I would do is I would point uh, to Gloria Steinem, and I would point to Josh, and I would point to Jeff, and I would point to these amazing writers who have won this award, and I would ask my grandmother, Mama, do you still think it's true that people will judge me by the company I keep? <laughs> Because if it is true, then that is prize enough in and of itself. I am so thrilled uh, to become part of this community, to become part uh, of this family of authors and writers and thinkers and believers in the power of literature. You know, I wrote my book because I really think uh, there are four things that we can all do uh, to create more peace, to create more justice. Uh, I wrote my book because I'm persuaded that we all have to find ways to get proximate to the things that are creating tension and conflict and suffering and inequality. I believe there's power in proximity. I think when we choose to get closer to the spaces in our community where there's suffering and inequality, when we actually position ourselves in places where there's been abuse of power and we become witnesses, that's the only way we can actually create more peace. You can't problem solve from a distance. We get things wrong in politics because we're trying to make up solutions too far away. You hear things when you're up close. You see things when you're up close. There's power in proximity. Uh, I'm the product of someone's choice to get proximate. Uh, my sister and I started our education in a colored school, in a community where black children were not allowed to go to the public schools. Lawyers came into our community and made them open up the public school in compliance with Brown versus Board of Education. And because of that, I got to go to high school. I got to go to college. I got to go to law school. And then when I was in law school, I got to meet people who were uh, on death row, literally dying for legal assistance. And that proximity not only told me that there, were, there was work that needed to be done, but it showed me that I had power, not power rooted in intellect, not power rooted in talent or gift, but power rooted in witness. And when you get proximate, you can become a witness to the tactics and the strategies and the power of peace. And I believe in proximity. And I think we can all get proximate. We don't have to live another world. We don't have to be a writer. We can just be proximate in the spaces where there's trouble and discord and unhappiness and suffering. The second thing that I'm persuaded that we have to do, and it's the reason why I wrote this book, is that we have to change the narratives that sustain inequality. Mass incarceration in this country was created by bad policies. We decided to deal with drug dependency as a crime issue rather than a health issue. We uh, let our politicians begin to promote the politics of fear and anger. They've been uh, competing with each other over who can be the toughest on crime. We m created mandatory sentences. We did a lot of just damaging things. But the real threat is the narrative that 
idea that we should stay angry and we should stay afraid. And I will tell you, whenever a country, whenever a community makes decisions rooted in fear and anger, you will abuse other people. Fear and anger are the enemies of peace. And we have to fight against fear. We have to fight against this judgment that is rooted in anger and bigotry. And that narrative has to change. I also think we have to change the narrative in this country about race. We've all been infected by a disease, this disease rooted in a narrative of racial difference. For me, the great uh, evil of so much of what we are dealing with is this narrative. And we have to change the narrative. We have to talk about things we haven't talked about. I love Margaret's book because I believe we have to talk about slavery in America. We never had the conversation we should have had 100 years ago, 50 years ago. And because of it, we're still burdened by this legacy that slavery has created. The great evil of American slavery for me was not involuntary servitude, was not forced labor. The great evil of American slavery was the narrative of racial difference we created, the ideology of white supremacy we created to legitimate slavery. And we never did anything about that. If you read the 13th Amendment, there's nothing in there about the narrative of racial difference. There's nothing in there about the ideology of, racial supre of white supremacy. And because of that, I don't believe slavery ended in 1865. I think it just evolved. It turned into decades of racial hierarchy and terrorism, and it resulted in lynchings and terrorism. Older people of color come up to me sometimes, they say, Mr. Stevenson, I get angry when I hear somebody on TV talking about how we're dealing with terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. So we grew up with terror. We had to worry about being bombed and lynched every day of our lives. The demographic geography of this state, of this nation, was shaped by terror. The African Americans in Dayton and Cincinnati and Cleveland and Chicago and Detroit in Boston and New York did not come to these communities as immigrants looking for new opportunities. They came to these communities as refugees and exiles from terror. And we haven't told that story. Even civil rights, I get worried. I hear people talking about the civil rights and we're so celebratory. And I worry about that because we haven't dealt with the fact that for decades in this country, we humiliated people of color. We burdened people, we battered people, we excluded people. My parents were humiliated every day of their lives. Every time they had to see that sign that said white and color, there was an injury. We told black people, you're not good enough to vote. You're not good enough to go to the schools with us. And we haven't dealt with that. I think we needed truth and reconciliation at the end of the civil rights movement and we didn't do it. And because of that, we are now burdened with a presumption of guilt that follows too many people. It's why that young man was shot and killed in a Walmart. It's why there is such angst and insecurity. And we have to change the narrative. We can't get to peace until we understand the narratives of bigotry and exclusion. But the third thing for me is hope. I wrote this book because I'm ultimately persuaded that we have to be more hopeful about what we can do. I believe things I haven't seen. I have to. I believe that we've got to find ways to resurrect our hope. I am persuaded that uh, hopelessness is the enemy of peace. It is the enemy of justice. Injustice prevails where hopelessness persists. And if we don't find ways to stay hopeful, the society that's most dangerous is the society made up of people who don't think that things can get better, who don't believe that they have the power to make a difference. That is the recipe for abuse of power. And I wrote this book because I'm persuaded if we can get people to choose to get proximate, change narratives, and do hopeful things, we can create more peace. But the final thing, the fourth thing that I wrote this book about is because I believe that if we really want to create peace, if we really want to create more justice, we can't just get proximate, we can't just change narratives, we can't just be hopeful, we've got to do uncomfortable things. That's the fourth thing. You cannot create peace, you cannot create justice by only doing what's comfortable and convenient. I've read, I've studied, I've looked all over the world to find instances where oppression ended, where inequality ended, and every time I've read and studied, it ended when someone chose to do something uncomfortable. Doing difficult things is hard. I know it, but I believe it's necessary. And what a great community like this can do, when it chooses to do it, is change the world. I think there's a different metric system for those of us who really believe in peace, who believe in the power of literature to sustain peace. And I was taught to me by this older man, I'll end with this, this older man, I was giving a talk in a church some years ago. And this older man came into the church and he was sitting in a wheelchair staring at me the whole time I was talking. He had this very stern, angry look on his face and I, and I was worried about him because he just looked at me so intensely, intensely. He had me a little unnerved and I was trying to get through my talk but he kept staring at me. And I got through the talk and people came up, they were very nice, they were very appropriate, but that man kept staring at me. And when everybody else left, he got a little boy to wheel him up to me in the middle of this church. And this older black man in this wheelchair came up the aisle of that church with this very stern, almost angry look on his face. And when he got in front of me, he put his hand up and he said, do you know what you're doing? And I just stood there. And he asked me again, he said, do you know what you're doing? 
And I stepped back and I mumbled something. I don't even remember what I said. He asked me one last time. He said, do you know what you're doing? And then he looked at me and he says, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. And that older black man looked at me. He said, you're beating the drum for justice. You keep beating the drum for justice. And I was so moved. I was also really relieved because I just didn't know. <laughs> Then he grabbed me by my jacket and he pulled me into his wheelchair. He said, come here, come here, come here, I'm gonna show you something. And this older man turned his head, he said, he said, you see the scar I have behind my right ear? He said, I got that scar in Greene County, Alabama in 1963, trying to register people to vote. He turned his head, he said, you see this cut I have down here at the bottom of my neck? He said, I got that cut in Philadelphia, Mississippi, 1964, trying to register people to vote. He turned his head, he said, you see this dark spot, you see that bruise? He said, got my bruise in Birmingham, Alabama, 1965, trying to register people to vote. And then he looked at me, he says, I'm going to tell you something, young man. He said, people look at me, they think I'm some old man sitting in a wheelchair covered with cuts and bruises and scars. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, these aren't my cuts. These aren't my bruises. These aren't my scars. He said, these are my medals of honor. And I will tell you something, uh, that I believe that when we, do the things that are necessary, when we get proximate, when we change narratives, when we stay hopeful, when we do uncomfortable things, we'll get nicked a little bit, we'll get cut, but that's how we create peace. I believe really simple things. I believe that each person is more than the worst thing they've ever done. I think if somebody tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think if someone takes something, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill somebody, you're not just a killer. And the other things you are is what a just society must find. I also am persuaded that in this country, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. We talk too much about money in America. I believe that in this country and in the communities like this, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. I believe the opposite of poverty is justice. And finally, I believe that when I come to Dayton, when I come to Ohio, when I go anywhere in this country, we can't really measure how we're doing, our character, our commitment to justice, our commitment to peace by looking at how we treat the rich and the powerful and the privileged. I think you have to judge a community, its character, its commitment to justice by looking at how it treats the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned. And tonight, by shining this wonderfully warm, restorative light that you have created here in Dayton uh, with me, tonight, by embracing me and the kind of work that I do, uh, you've made me believe uh, that the times I've been nicked the times I've been cut, the times I've been scarred have not been times that have been wasted, but you've made me believe that through your light, and yes, maybe through your embrace and through your love, that those nicks and cuts and scars can be turned into something that is truly honorable. And for that, I cannot tell you how grateful I am. I cannot tell you how honored I am. And I cannot tell you how I appreciate this moment and this recognition. Thank you all very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, my car is outside. I'm lifting the trunk. I have my Stevenson for President yeah. bumper stickers, dollar each. See you down there. Man, oh, Shevitz, look out. That was amazing.